Hello and welcome inside Take to Take. Patrick Town here, as always, joined alongside Nick Robinson and Luke Burrows for episode numero 50. This is just insane. I, I, I didn't realize we've done this many episodes. Uh, who would have thought that the three of us would be doing shows for this long? And who would have thought? A surprise What's the meme? Get Look at us. Yeah. I, I would say the Not only me. thing more surprising than us hitting 50 shows is that Nikita Zaitsev is the favorite for the Norris Trophy right now. That's yeah. that's the only thing more surprising. Is he? Well, he's a uh, best analytical defenseman so far. Oh, three games in. That's why I missed it. Yeah. yeah. So we've been uh, this. What started as just three guys wanted to talk hockey on Spirit Live. Uh, we continued that through the second semester, first year, and then. Uh, continued second year in the summer. We did some shows when COVID hit, uh, did some stuff with Barn Burner Network, left doing our own thing right now, have some interviews set up. Um, do you guys have a, a favorite moment, a favorite episode at least, or, or just out of all the episodes we've done? Um, is there one that you could think that was the best for either of you? Got to be November 2019's uh, Christmas special before we wrapped up our second run with Spirit Live. That's got to be it. Uh, there are definitely some gems in there. And I I have gone back and listened a couple of times. Um, loud Christmas music and yelling about hockey always makes for an interesting that. mix. Yeah. Christmas I would music. also say when Patrick and I had a debate on fighting uh, and we were sitting beside each other and I actually wanted to reach over and <laughs> fight him after uh, the discussion <laughs> on fighting, I would say that that one is up there for me as well. I yeah. yeah the Christmas uh, the Christmas episode was good because I don't think we've done a Christmas episode since, but um another one that stands out for me was our first one back, uh, our first COVID episode. Um, we were all at home. It, I think it was in like May or something, and we were all just talking about um, just all the possibility with the NHL. And I just it was uh, it was good to be back. That was fun to do. I think that was the first episode we ever did just on our own and um you know kind of glad we we continued that that was a that was a good start yeah that was kind of a weird time um when all that Very happened weird. we didn't really know what was going to happen um uh if i were to think i think the thing i missed the most is just being in studio being in studio was fun having that routine of getting up and going setting everything up setting up the live stream through twitter uh i missed that a lot and being in studio i feel like the, the way we talk to each other is a little bit different and i also just think listening back and i told you guys uh probably about a couple months ago listening back to the first episodes we've done compared to the episodes now uh we got a lot better and um i think we should uh you know give, our, give ourselves some credit but for me i'd probably say my fa my favorite one was probably the christmas one that was the funniest moment for sure i've never laughed so hard i think during a radio show but the one that i'll that i thought was just a, a good a good show was was the fighting debate um because we we got to the studio we said hello we sat down debated hockey and then forgot about it um at least i hope we forgot about it anyway uh that was a ton of fun and, it, and it's been it's been it's been fun to record with you guys and for those who have tuned into our show and continue to do so thank you and hopefully we'll uh we'll have some stuff lined up in the future some interviews and we have a big interview today that we uh we're excited to 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 get to so yeah, I do miss the uh, audio quality now that you said it's Spirit Live. Now I'm sort of thinking back. It also looks way cooler than this does. Yes. It's way better. It's like, it's so much easier to feed off each other when we're all in the studio. That's yeah. such a, I don't know, one day, hopefully next year. We'll There's be something but... to be said about being in the same room <clears throat> with yeah. everybody to do stuff. This is the, this is good, but it's not the same. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think not being in studio has helped us improve our own recordings. We all have mics. We all have good headphones. We all have fairly quiet spaces and it helps. Also like being being in TV labs in our program that tell us how to set up and stuff like that. It's been good. So um, yeah. that just about does it for our sort of tribute to our 50th 50th show. It's been it's been a lot of fun and it's fun to do shows with you guys. And uh, we've definitely had some good moments, some heated debates. Uh, I've definitely uh, finished shows feeling irritated with some of you. Uh, I've definitely done shows feeling irritated at the time. And I know you guys can say the same because we've talked about some pretty uh, some pretty Fun, some pretty fun stuff but also some heavy stuff here and there i think we've a good thing about our show is we cover a wide variety of topics we don't just we're not just strictly analysis we'll get into some some touchy subjects some stuff that's hard to talk about and i think that's important and uh it's been a lot of fun to do show with you guys and i hope um you know here's to the next 50 but that just about does it for this part we're going to send it over to an interview we have a guest with marco d'amico aka the hockey expert on twitter he is a stats guy for 91 fm and uh yeah we'll take you over there right now 
All right, guys, we are inside the interview here. Patrick Talon, Luke Burrows, and Nick Robinson, this time with a guest. Uh, long overdue. We, I've been talking to him for, for quite some time. Uh, Marco D'Amico, a.k.a. The Hockey Expert on Twitter. Uh, per his bio, his stats guru, amateur scouting and analytics, and a former stats expert at 91.9 Sports FM. Uh, Marco, thanks so much uh, for coming on. Oh, it's a pleasure, guys. Hockey season's back. Yeah, this is my favorite time. Generally, we do this in October, but like, you know, <laughs> yeah. better now than never. So yeah. I, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, lots of hockey to talk about. Lots of things going on right now in the league. So it's going to be a good show. Yeah. Um, the Canadian division has been a ton of fun. And Marco, you and I have talked about that endlessly. But before we touch on on some of the more recent news, let's get to know you a little bit. And because uh, you've built quite quite the pre- impressive following on Twitter. Um, and, and your Twitter presence is well known around. You've, you've gotten some pretty good engagement. So um, before we get to that, I want to know your role in radio and st- specifically with 91.9. Can you sort of talk about how you got that role specifically as a stats expert? Yeah, so that was a... Uh... That was a really very random situation. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Um, my, uh, I knew George Larac uh, personally because of his affiliation with the uh, Auto Prix in Montreal, the, the, the car company. They did do a lot of advertising together. And one day I just so happened to be in the office and my uncle was like, hey, you know, you guys looking for a, an intern by any chance? And he was just like, yeah, what do you know, kid? And you try telling George Larac, who's... <laughs> six three an infinite amount of pounds that well tell me what you want to know and i'll find it so within a week uh, i was at their uh, at the office in in montreal and this was right around the time of the 2016 draft um and we all remember the 2016 draft because yep. pk suban was everywhere and those rumors were coming out from him uh and so it was pretty wild it was it was a really fun summer um and I did that for about a good year and a half. Uh, got to meet a lot of people. Uh, Joel Bouchard uh, came in a few times to, to meet us when he was coaching the uh, Armada. Um, you know, uh, interviewing guys like uh, La Tendresse, uh, Milan Lucic, Max Pacioretty, uh, Brennan Gallagher, uh, you know, and, and meeting legends, you know, just walking through there. Like, it just a crazy experience. Um, and I, this is kind of why I like to push people in that direction. I went to Concordia university. Uh, they funnel a lot of the English Montreal, uh, sports journalists. So, um, for those that follow the Calgary flames, newly hired Selim Valji comes from my group of friends, uh, at Concordia. So we, um, we have a pretty tight knit circle, but it was the first time that I, who didn't actually study journalism proceeded mm. to partake in sports journalism. So, uh, non-traditional, but a whole lot of fun. Cool. So, Marco, uh, a discussion we have on here quite a bit, uh, numerous times, um, is sort of the advanced analytics versus the eye test debate. Uh, And where you stand on that, it's probably pretty clear just based on your background. But we'd love to hear your opinion, add it to to what we think, because we have we're kind of all over the map. Yeah. Where, uh, where where do you kind of see yourself on that spectrum? Because it certainly is a spectrum. That's something oh, yeah. we've learned. Believe it's not me. not one or the other. So where do you kind of put yourself? And some people don't even know where they are on the spectrum. Yeah. So like you have Pierre Maguire that's like, analytics don't prove anything. The eye test tells me that, you know, the Tampa Bay Lightning were good. Yeah, but if you look at the stats, Tampa Bay was an excellent analytical team. Like, what? No. Um, I feel like there are certain statistics that are kind of um, – extrapolated and and used as kind of figureheads by the analytics community and i feel like that is where it kind of loses its pizzazz in my opinion you have to be able to take these statistics and tell a story and i feel like those that are able to kind of crunch the numbers really you know uh establish a low standard of deviation when it comes to the way that their statistics are laid out and then kind of present them in a way that is both you know kosher and easily engageable well, then that's how you get people. This is why, for example, something that uh, Patrick and I go- joke about not, uh, pretty often are heat maps. Heat maps are the bane of my existence because it's so difficult to actually track without the proper model. And, and, and so generally people will just look at that and take it for granted. Where, where Patrick and I kind of go in even further is look at the methodology behind how that heat map is then formed. What instances or what actions on the ice then kind of you know, influence that model. So a lot of people will ignore the methodology, whereas I feel like 
if people would take more time to explain their methodology, I feel like a lot more people would be on board uh, and it would act as a great complement to the eye test. And I feel like the best teams in terms of amateur and professional scouting are able to utilize both optimally. And I feel like we see that, for example, I'll give you, I, it pains me to say this, but the Toronto Maple Leafs are able to take analytics and the eye test and, and zone in on players that could definitely give more than what, you know, normal fans would think based on trends, based on the way that they play. So I'm very much of the analytics community. Uh, I'm just, I was one of the early ones that was able to try and convince certain, I would say, uh, veterans of the field without necessarily calling them dinosaurs, uh, veterans <laughs> of the field uh, that there is, you know, a, a serious need for further uh, discussion on that, further development in that. Uh, and I feel like if it were that much of an importance, the NHL wouldn't be investing billions of dollars on pucks that are now considered too heavy uh, for certain hockey players. Uh, we, 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 we need to advance on that because other sports, you know, soccer, for example, I, I follow soccer a lot. The analytics game in soccer is just like, wow, uh, they're on another level. So uh, if hockey's trending there, I feel like it can only benefit the sport. So you sort of touched on it when you mentioned Pierre Maguire and maybe some of the quote unquote dinosaurs of the field. But, you know, I'll ask you in your opinion, why do you think some people are so against using advanced stats that can be anybody in the media, just casual fans? Like, why do you think people are against it? Well, it depends. Like, if you look at a guy like Pierre Maguire, Pierre Maguire uh, was fundamentally uh, a storyteller, uh, a guy that was able to and sometimes go into, you know, excruciating detail on certain players and, and grow, you know, how they grew up and what university they went to. And I feel like it's that kind of storytelling. That's very personal analytics removes really the personal from it. And it looks specifically at the performance. There is no influence on stats, stats or stats. It's how you go about presenting them that, that determines the narrative. I feel like it threatens certain people. I feel like it threatens old school journalists who don't kind of understand what's going on. Steve Simmons, I'm talking about you. Uh, you know, if you look at, other journalists that are in the know right now, you look at Arpin Basu in Montreal, uh, Salem Valji in Calgary, uh, you know, the, uh, Dalywal as well in Vancouver. These are individuals that have caught on, put in the effort, put in the time, and are therefore able to provide better content to everybody that is willing to read it. So why not? I feel like th we've come to a crux right now in sports journalism where if you don't have an analytical side to your, your evaluation, and to your to, to your content, I use zone out because it it becomes that kind of old school, almost like you know uh, emotional uh, evaluation of sport. And frankly, I have no time for an emotional evaluation of sport. This is we're in 2021. Like we have AI that can do your job, so you got to bring in something that's both personal and factual. And I feel like the best of the best are rising to the top at the right time. Well, it's funny that you mentioned Steve Simmons because, you know, somebody like him won't use numbers to tell his stories, but he's more interested in perhaps the number of hot dogs, for instance, uh, certain superstars eating on his off days. So it's funny that you bring that up, but Pat, I'll throw it over to you. Yeah. Um, this sort of ties into the last questions and the sort of the theme, because you are, you are a stats guy. Um, what do you think is a common misconception? What do you think people misunderstand about using advanced statistics? Because we know, we've talked about it endlessly, some people, it seems like it's sort of a with you or against you kind of mentality. So what do you think people sort of misunderstand? I feel like it's a d double faceted question. First of all, I feel like there's a certain arrogance to the of the analytics community to those who don't necessarily appreciate it as much, specifically because they, it's almost Bible thumping to a degree. Like here are the stats, my stats don't lie. Whatever opinion you may have is now irrelevant because my stats say so. Now, I anybody who's done statistics for a long time in their lives or any number crunching whatsoever, there is a standard deviation. Now, that deviation can be, at times, higher than you think. So there is no way that your stats are the truth necessarily all the time. But however, they provide a pattern for you to base yourself on on long term. So anybody that's looking at... Um, I don't know, let's throw a, a player out there. Anybody that's looking at Austin Matthews and his uh, advanced statistics say when it comes to defensive acumen, uh, anybody who thinks that Austin Matthews is not a good defensive player because the Leafs do not produce well uh, in the playoffs, um, 
no, we need to dive deeper. We need to look at what makes Austin Matthews good or bad. And ultimately, anybody who takes the time to then dive into it, become, it becomes more interesting. Uh, one of the key, uh, I would say, metrics uh, that would be, I guess, fundamental to people not being able to understand is expected goals and expected goals against. You know, it's a metric that is consistently being, you know, nipped at. Expected by who? You know, why? And every model is, you know, somewhat different. But, you know, the key crux is if you play a certain way, you're expected to score a certain amount of goals. So it's a key underlier to understanding how good a player is in providing offense and limiting it, both sides. So, again, uh, people need to open themselves up. Um, I feel like I, I've spent my entire... Uh, adult life trying to teach individuals that don't know anything about stats to en enjoy stats uh and just yesterday my uncle messaged me saying hey kakanyemi had the highest expected goals yes last night that's amazing and i just like i explained to a 55 year old what expected goals for were and he's on natural stat trick every day now just trying to check out what that is so it's all in the way you present it so if we're talking relevancy i guess um advanced stats this season do you and there might not be any difference but do you see this season resulting in any um conflicts or issues in terms of uh shortened play uh realignment divisions being isolated is there any any of that being taken into account when advanced stats are being used over the next four months i feel like it'll become probably more of an anomaly the further on we go into the season. So right now it's sloppy hockey. This is where you can distinguish the good from the bad, right? Whereas the moment that the pace starts picking up and it, the, the difference in, 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 in possession, uh, the difference in uh, shot quality, uh, the, they're going to shake off the rust. They're going to go to those harder areas the tighter the games get because all the games are four point games now that all the games are interdivisional. So it's going to be tight. It's going to be practically playoff hockey uh, by February. Uh, it, it's already we're seeing tight games like the Montreal Vancouver game. I didn't care that it was one o'clock in the morning when that game was over. I was sold from the, from the start to the end. That was playoff hockey. So I feel like uh, we're going to get, if not more of a, uh, a value from analytics right now because of the shortened season, because of how condensed uh, the games are. And also because teams are going to be playing themselves so often in such a small stretch of time. Uh, that it would even allow us to look at how different players adapted their performances based on game one to two to three versus the same team. So it opens up an entire other narrative, and that would be series performances, player versus team. And is that I, something I, that is being taken into account already, or pe like looking at specific series? I think I think right now, if you look at certain teams, like I know, for example, I I'm going about it now with Montreal. Like I specifically wanted to see what Montreal versus Vancouver would give because, in my honest opinion, <clears throat> that might actually be a playoff series uh, in 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 May. So, it's worth it's worth mentioning because media is going. Yeah, I know exactly. I mean, <laughs> oh, good lord, <laughs> the the banter. But yeah. from an analytics perspective, it's even more relevant because. Here are Montreal and Vancouver playing three games straight this very week. So it's relevant once you get to the playoffs because you already have all that data. And then you can say, well, okay, Montreal going into the playoffs should probably shore up this, this, and this to better counter the strengths of Vancouver, which are X, Y, and Z. So to me, I think it becomes ever more important. Well, I would, I think I'm definitely speaking for everybody when I say a Montreal Vancouver playoff series or just games like last night in general would up the watchability of this show for sure. But I'll move away now from sort of just the focused analytics discussion more so to you, Marco. Um, maybe just take us through a bit how you got your uh, first steps in the online hockey community and how you've been able to build up a following like you have. Honestly, like this, just talking, talking, uh, sharing stats. Um, I'm more of a storyteller per se. Like I have a master's degree in history. So I, I'm not traditionally uh, an analytics guy. I just have uh, a degree that forced me to do both stats and look at sports. Uh, so it kind of worked out well. It's based on being able to tell a story to relate to fans, be they the same fans of the team you root for or not. Uh, and, and really being able to kind of market yourself. Um, I know that my, my Twitter handle says the hockey expert, 
Uh, but to be completely honest with you, that was a running gag between my friends and I. Uh, and when we saw that the handle was available, uh, I was dared to take it uh, or face a lifetime of shame. So I, I chose no shame and went with the handle. Uh, through that time, uh, based on connections, uh, radio show segments, uh, podcasts, uh, you know, you build up a following, you, you, you interact with as many people as you want. Um, and it really is fun. And, and, and if you, if you were to ask my fiance right now, like, how did he build the following? She'd give you a couple of swear words followed by so many podcasts. Um, so I guess my goal is to be as present as possible, uh, and be within as many conversations as possible. And the more you diversify, uh, the way you look at a sport and, and talk about a sport, I feel like it gives you that platform to be something unique. Uh, this is why I enjoy watching a lot of these younger journalists come up right now and tackling subjects, uh, that are very unique, uh, and, and haven't been hammered out. And that's, what's driving content right now is that unique ability right now, especially with COVID all this time we have on our hands to, to further assess, further address, and then further contextualize things. Uh, and I feel like hockey as a sport has grown for that, uh, for, for that very trend. And I was happy to be a part of it. Awesome. All right. So, uh, you're a Habs fan. We talk Habs all the time. Luke is a Canucks fan. Um, Let's uh let's get into last night's game. And before we get into who 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 played who played who whatever, that was probably the most entertaining Montreal Canadiens game I have seen in the last three years. Maybe I don't know if you, I don't know if you agree. Two years maybe. Yeah. yeah. Remember that Montreal versus Washington game that ended six five with Domi scoring in the last. Okay. Yeah. Seconds? Yes, I that, do remember that one. Yes. That, that was fair. It. That. So but that's it. Yeah, but that that was fun. And um, honestly, I didn't think either team played that great. Like the off the offense was good, but but I can't look at that game and say Vancouver deserved to win it more than Montreal or Montreal deserved to win it more than Vancouver. It was just, um, and Luke is already ready to say some stuff, but I don't disagree. Um, I'm just, you're just happy with, with the dub. So um, Nick, as an outsider's perspective, you won't have a bias. So I'm going to start with you as the Sens fan. <laughs> what did you make of last night's game? And what were your thoughts on uh, the six, five victory that Canucks had over the Canadians? Oh man, like where do you even start? So many goals. I First off, games like that are great for hockey. And you know that Gary Bettman is sitting in the NHL front office with a big smile on his face when he sees games like that, because that's quite frankly where everybody wants the NHL to be. And that was so good to see last night. Um, you know, both teams obviously didn't defend very well at all, but there were some great goals. I thought uh, Toffoli was excellent last night. Again, obviously with the, his first three goals as I had by far his best game so far, um, he looked dangerous. I didn't like how for Vancouver, I didn't like defensively. I feel like they gave Montreal way too many opportunities on the rush. The amount of tap-ins Montreal was able to score, Toffoli pretty much had to stand with the stick on the ice the yeah. whole night to score. But same goes for Montreal on the other end. I don't like how they defended the net front at all. Um, you look at Besser's second goal where he was pretty much just able to chop a backhander from the slot uncontested. There's a lot of things both teams are going to work on. Um, I would pretty much expect almost the opposite the next time the two play each other because everybody's going to be so focused on the defense that we're going to forget to score now. So it's going to be an interesting one to follow uh, the next time they play each other. But it was a great game last night. Luke, your thoughts? Well, um, it was like regardless of who you're cheering for, that was a good game. I think we all agree there. I, I kind of found a lot of... A lot of players were very off last night and a lot, I, I think a lot of players had a really good game. Um, I will say to Foley though, if you look at his goals, they were given to him. A lot of them, um, the defense, the defending is just brutal to watch on a lot of those. Um, I thought, I thought, you know, here comes the bias. I thought Besser looked really good. I thought Horvat looked really good. Um, yeah. Pedersen oh, looked garbage I don't, even, I don't want to go there <laughs> no bad i and i don't hey, and he I, hasn't looked there the whole season yeah, okay I that, that, that's what that's, that's what i wanted that to get coming. to yeah but, this is what i wanted to get to so I'll, I'll put it out now because i think our thoughts on the game would probably all be be the same it was it was a, it was a it was a fun game it was a messy game but luke let me ask you about elias patterson because i don't, I don't know because this is this is uh he he it's one thing to play well and not score but it's another thing to play the way he did. My, I'm not big on plus minus, but minus three in a game where your team scores five goals he, and you are the offensive guy. What do you what do you make of his of his performance lately? He looks upset. He looks rattled out there. Um, 
and it, it just it keeps getting worse. He had a the opening game. He he was normal. He he had an assist. He he looked fine. Since then, it's just been downhill. Um, that being said, though, he's I don't know. Like if he he like he tried to go between the legs on Price last night. That is not at all what I would have expected from someone whose confidence is in the ground right now. And so, yeah, him going down and trying that, it just, it, it's confusing. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I don't want to call him snake bitten because it's not that he is getting really good chances and he's just getting unlucky. He is just so in his head right now. And I do think, I do think all, it, all it's going to take is one, one goal and he'll, he'll, oh, yeah. he'll snap it. He'll get out of it. So I'm, I'm not concerned long-term, but oh boy, it's just, it sucks to watch him right now because you know, like he's, he's supposed to be the most exciting player on the ice. Um, and just circling back, Hughes didn't look good last night either, but that's not, he's, um, he's been fine uh, for the first three games uh, for sure. could be better, but not, not at all concerning like, like Pedersen is right now. All right, Marco last night, what did you like and what did you not like about Montreal's performance? Uh <laughs> it's going to be a mirror image of what we said about the Canucks. That's okay. <laughs> uh, offensively at five on five. Wow. I just, uh, you know, I feel like Vancouver's special teams, that power play is just unreal. I mean, the Quinn Hughes, JT Miller, Horvat kind of combo that they have going on on the left side of the power play is, I just yeah. love it. Love it. Love it. Keep doing that. You guys are going to make the playoffs with that. I don't even care. Uh, where I was concerned about was defensively. I, if you look at uh, the first Toffoli goal where Kakaniemi just, you know, cross ice pass to Foley's by himself at the blue line. And you just have like a bad line change and Quinn Hughes just rushing to get there and, and no chance just far in I, it's, it was just such sloppy, you know, non-training camp prior to season type of hockey which we have to get used to. I feel like the first 10 games of the season are going to be like that. Where I found that I, 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 you know, Vancouver kind of didn't play its game was that I found the high slot highly accessible. Usually Vancouver plays a man short on the high slot so that they don't have anybody kind of being able to do the cross seam passes. There were a lot of cross ice passes last night. The Gallagher goal being one of them, but that was again on the rush. Uh, the Cockney Emmy goal though, where he was kind of alone in the slot and allowed enough time. And, and Kakaniemi has, you know, his own issues in terms of the speed of his release. Uh, was still able to get that shot off, which I found to be really cool uh, as a Habs fan. But also I question that as, a, as, a, as, a, as you know, a third-party guy attempting to be, at least, uh, watching that play. So I found that, uh, or I think that, you know, Travis Green is going to come around and be like, okay, against Montreal, the center has to play the high slot absolutely at all times because that's how they're dangerous is that they you know they they penetrate the zone the puck goes back to the d's the d's end up finding the forward that's in the high slot and the puck generally finds its way to the net and then the back of the net that's the way that's montreal's bread and butter so if vancouver is going to be successful tonight the high slot is going to be occupied by a vancouver canucks center in my opinion at all times um well i i do want to ask you because this has been the talk the past couple weeks it's kind of died down but but it's still been talked about we've talked about it on our show before and that is the Pierre-Luc Dubois conversation he was just pushed to the I think he's centering the third line I think we saw that this morning in, in Columbus yeah. um this has been talked about Montreal's in on it apparently according to Nick Kiprios take with that what you will though uh this is the same guy who said Weber would retire and then Weber came back a day later so anyway let's talk about that so do you think there is a move to be made uh between Bergevin and Kekalainen for Dubois and if so would you do it Oh, tough question, but I know, I know because there is the partisan aspect to that. And then there's the logical aspect to that. Now, if the Habs are going for it this year, next year, it makes sense to sell the future for the present. And so that's why I believe a Kakanyemi centered deal for Dubois kind of makes sense. Uh, but for me, again, when I, I watch both players play, uh, at the age of 17, Dubois even 16 uh, in the Maritimes, I think they have the same kind of potential, you know, give or take five points uh, on average. I feel like they're both eventually going to be 60 to 65 point centers every season. 
uh, on on really good teams. I feel like Dubois could potentially have that one to two seventy point seasons, depending on what wingers he has. So for me, it's a today or tomorrow kind of uh, uh, approach, right? So if you want to go for it this year, you get the local guy. I can see it, but you know you have to add you know the fact that he has to quarantine for fourteen days which would kind of make sense as of next week because the Habs are off for four or five games. Uh, you have to add the fact that he's got to get used to the system. Um, and again, it's two years and then you got to sign him again. And that's, you know, if even if you bridge Suzuki next year, like you're going to have an issue and you have to re-sign to know. There's a lot of insecurity that I wouldn't be trading. I wouldn't be running to trade controlled assets like a Suzuki, like a Kakaniemi. Uh, especially when you don't know what's going to happen with Phil Deneau. Now, if Phil Deneau agrees to an extension, okay, then we can start having that conversation. But ultimately, to me, Pierre-Luc Dubois, and I've said this a lot, we've anointed him a first-line center. I don't think he's there yet. I don't think he's a first-line center yet. I don't think he can take a team on his back a whole season, not 10 games in the playoffs, a whole season, and make them a playoff team. I feel like last year he benefited benefited from being on the best defensive team, one of the best defensive teams in the NHL, uh, analytically, statistically, and visually. Uh, and so he never really has to deal with the defensive side. He is a guy that is going to be deployed 70, 70 to 75% of the time in an offensive zone situation, barely any PK time. He's con consistently playing offense. I don't know how that would translate in Montreal, whereas in Montreal, we demand two-way excellence from centers. I don't know. Now, obviously, you can easily say, well, then just fire Claude Julien, which, you know, maybe I agree with you. But any other coach or any other GM in Montreal is going to look at the situation and be like, okay, you at least have to be consistent in face-offs. You have to be, have a good two-way presence consistently, and you have to score consistently because as we've seen with Jonathan Drouin, if you're a French Canadian player and you mm. come to Montreal and you have a five game slump, my man, good luck. You yeah. better have the fortitude. Yeah. And uh, I, I think I would agree for the most part. And I want to touch on, on Cockney. I mean, to know just real quick, just to get your thoughts and uh, we'll keep it short because we do have other topics to get to, but I want to ask you, and this is what we talked about yesterday is the peculiar situation that is Montreal center depth. You have Nick Suzuki who technically is Montreal's first line center at this point. You have Phil Deneau playing with Tatar and Gallagher, and then you have Kakanyemi playing with Armia and Toffoli. And looking back at, at Kakanyemi's draft, the potential that people saw was similar to Barkov, was similar to um, to Kopitar. That's what people thought of Kakanyemi, a good two-way center uh, who can play that type of game. Now, he hasn't been given the opportunity, in my opinion, to, to flourish. He's been given third-line minutes with third- and fourth-line wingers. Everyone is saying that Deneau's future depends on Kakanyemi, but if he is not given the chance, what do you think happens with Philip Deneau? And I guess what I'm trying to ask you is, do you think Philip Deneau resigns or not? And how much do you think hinges on Kakanyemi? I feel like a lot of it hinges on Kakanyemi. We discussed this uh, daily at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, we So this becomes a question of leverage. If Kakanyemi is able to come in and kind of take care of business, uh, produce like a top six center and be defensively responsible at five on five. Well, similarly to what we see with Suzuki, he's going to wind up on the PK soon. Right. Uh, and we've been harping on Kakaniemi's face-offs. He went from 11% to 44, 46% to like 66% to 77% last night. So there's progress in his game. There's consistent progress in his game. Uh, nothing leads me to believe that he won't be a top six center at this point. It's, it's the question of, will he be a bona fide first line center? But as you pointed out, Suzuki is arguably, arguably, I will say yeah, pretty much there at yeah. this point. So, eh, what do you do? And so if I'm Mark Bergevin, I wait because the longer Bergevin waits into the season, the more leverage he will have. And if, if Deneau really just wants a paycheck, well, at that point before the deadline, you can you know accommodate that by providing the extension and forcing a trade if it means you can bring in a center of the same ilk or better and i feel like there's a lot to be juggled with here my personal opinion is you go with youth in this situation because 
Montreal has never, never developed a top line center in my lifetime. And they've already got one in the last year. It's rare to see. Yeah. Vancouver fans, you guys have Pedersen, who was drafted as a left wing initially, converted to a center, and became your first line center within 15 to 20 games. I found that amazing. And you had Horvat on the team, who, who easily, in my opinion, is, is a step above Dano, especially from a goal, scoring, a goal scoring perspective. So you can appreciate when you see a young kid kind of come in, take the reins as Suzuki does. But when you have two, it becomes extremely complicating as to how to deliver ice time. So I agree that he might not be given the best offensive tools to produce. And a lot of people have taken that to, to, to label him a bust. But I feel like if, if people take the time to study the analytics on Kakaniemi, I feel like he dominates the game on every single situation except the score sheet. That may be due to the way he is surrounded. Uh, that may be due to the fact that his stick may be too long. That may be due to a lot of things. But ultimately, if he does everything right already, the defense aspect is handled. The offense will come. Right. Uh, well said. And um, I, I think I, I think I'd agree with with just what everything you said. Um, all right. Well, let's touch on some other news, and this not as not as fun to talk about, but that is. Uh, Ovechkin, Samsonov, Kuznetsov, um, and I believe Dmitry Orlov on COVID-19 protocols list. So Dmitry Orlov had a hotel room gathering uh, within the last week or so, I guess. And as a result, the team was fined $100,000. Uh, Ovechkin spoke out. He said, I regret my choice to spend time together with my teammates in our hotel room and away from our locker room areas. I will learn from this experience. Um, I didn't. I didn't know the logistics. I guess players can... They have a design designated area in hotels and lounges, but they can't be together in their rooms. Personally, doesn't I don't understand that when they're going to be together in the lounge, but not in the rooms. Regardless, this is the rule that the NHL set, and I think this shows that they're going to crack down on it because we've seen how how bad it got with the MLB. We've seen how bad it's gotten with the NFL. It shows they're taking it seriously. Marco, what do you think about this? And do you think this is this is worth it? Do you think this is a a good uh, I guess sort of warning call? I feel like this is going to be like, we're just starting the season. The Canadians are, or sorry, the Canadians, all teams are playing 56 games. It's 56 games. Look at how many games were like postponed or, or, or delayed uh, in the NFL. The NFL plays 17 games. Now it's you're opening up a can of worms. If you're allowing your players to be in undisciplined in any way, shape or form. So I'm, fully on board with them following the, you know, the protocol and rules. Uh, personally for me, I feel like it was abundantly clear uh, at least in the, in the bubble uh, in Toronto and Edmonton, but even more so now, like you cannot in this situation, allow yourself to venture in a way that would potentially put you at risk of spreading something and ruining it for your team, which they now have right? Like, let's, let's call a spade a spade. Why are they the only four? If you, if you, you like, they played hockey together, they practiced together. Why are they the only four? Mm -hmm. So it leads me to believe that it was, you know, a tactile uh, form of, of, or, or, or whatever. Uh, They had to be in close proximity for that transmission to occur. So that's exactly why the NHL put in that kind of restriction. I understand it. When I saw the $100,000 fine, though, oh, I was not expecting that. I, I wow, that's a lot of money. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy that the league decided to make an example out of the Washington Capitals. Um, now, obviously, I know some folks in Russia think this is, this is uh, you know, racial profiling and, and, and they're out to get Russians. Um, but, I mean, at the end of the day, it also is telling that it's the four Russians on the team that were hanging out together alone in a, in a room. So it has, it has less to do with the fact that they're Russian and more to do with the fact that the four Russians decided to break the rules together. I, I feel like that's the thing. Like if Connor McMichael were in the room, we wouldn't be talking about this right now. Like that's true. Just, you know, like it would be an irrelevant thing, but ultimately that you be, you know, uh, Ovechkin's wife, Russian media. I think this is a non-issue from, from a racial perspective they messed up. They done goofed. And ultimately, 
there are strict protocols. The NHLPA is behind this as well. So you have no leg to stand on. Limit contact just as much as regular citizens are, are limiting contact and, you know, only congregate when there is a practice or a game situation. I feel like that is so clear. And the fact that they give them lounges so they can be spread out uh, in hotel rooms to, 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 to chill and, and be around each other. Like that's more than most of us get right now as, as regular people. So, you know, it's it, other teams are following it. There's 29 other teams or sorry, 30 other teams. We're going to be okay. So follow the rules. No, 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 no fine accordingly. Yeah, I think I think I would just kind of echo everything that was just said. I as as kind of trivial as it might seem, um, yeah, when you really think about it, what's the difference between the hotel room and the lounge? That's not that's not up to up to people not involved to to discuss. Um, regardless of what the rule is, the rule is the rule, and and they they broke it. I, I don't know what, what the context is in terms of other teams or other players on that team or other teams around the league. I don't know what's going on there, but those four people broke the rules and yeah, a hundred thousand dollars. That was, um, that was a bit of a surprise, but clearly the NHL is, is showing no, no slack with this, which yeah. is a good thing. Yeah. Um, unfortunate for the, for the players involved, but as far as we know, they they broke the rule that was outlined to them, and that's the punishment. I I I think it's uh it's an unfortunate situation, but I don't think it's unfair. Yeah, and I won't lie, I don't understand having if they're going to be together in the lounges, but unless in the lounge they're six feet apart, I don't know. But what it the doesn't. Rules are. But like the rule is the rule. Right. Like exactly. Just... Exactly. We. That, that's what I'm saying. It's like. I might not understand it, but it is still a rule and you do have to yeah. follow that. So that kind of, that took to um, Ovechkin's wife actually responding on Instagram and I'll sort of paraphrase here, but she said, of course, only Russian players on Washington were together in a hotel. Of course, all the other players are staying away and separating themselves uh, from their teammates. Of course, you can't catch the virus when you and your teammates sit together on the bench, hug each other when they score a goal or when they all are together in the lounge or locker room. Players can't get affected at malls or supermarkets, etc. Virus only works in a hotel room. The only the only one who came up with this, the only the person who came up with this rule is obviously very logical. By the way, both Ovechkin and Orlov have antibodies. Unfortunately, not everyone is competent uh, in their antibodies value and properties. That's loosely translated. Uh, but mm. again, comes back to the the sort of profile. We don't have to get into that, but I just think uh, we won't touch too much on it because I, th- I think I, I think it's a good thing what the league is doing. It's it's uh, it's a, it's a rule, and and things have gotten out of hand quickly. Um, even not, not in sports, we can touch it on. So, um, yeah. Even, and, uh, but even with sport, like look at the with NBA, sports. Exactly. Kyrie yeah. Irving find yeah. the same amount for yeah. being just as big, just breaking the rules. Like mm-hmm. every league does it. It has nothing to do with you. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's go back to the NHL real quick. Um, as we wrap up here, we're about two weeks, almost or a week and a half roughly, uh, into the NHL season. Uh, any players or teams that have, surprise you the most we'll start with surprises new jersey i feel like new jersey like obviously as like as we saw right now the, this live mm. uh mackenzie blackwood is on the uh covid uh list unfortunately he was on he was just fantastic but new jersey is just to me uh, a transformed team um you know the addition of ryan murray has just been great for for the new jersey devils he stabilized pk suban something I feel that only Andre Markov can boast. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that that's fantastic. Uh, Jack Hughes is here, ladies and gentlemen. Finally. Jack Hughes <laughs> is, has arrived, and he looks like he's ready for a point-per-game season, if, that, if, if not more. Yeah. So I'm loving the way that they surrounded their youth. I'm loving the way that Jack Hughes is now being positioned as that number one. Um, I feel like ultimately... Uh, New Jersey has the spoiler tag on them. I feel like they can kind of come in and maybe if they continue this kind of squeak into that third or fourth spot uh, to make the playoffs. Um, because obviously the team, uh, the, you know, there's an obvious team that's disappointed uh, that we'll probably get to. And Montreal Canadians are probably part of that reason. Uh, and that's the Pittsburgh Penguins. 
Um, but I, I do want to talk about one other team that's that's done really well and surprised me, and that's the San Jose Sharks. Uh, San Jose, for all intents and purposes, last year was a lottery team. Like they gave Ottawa a fifth yeah. overall pick. Yeah. Or sorry, a third overall pick. It was Ottawa's pick that was fifth overall. Yeah. Um, so there's no Stutzla without this Carlson trade. Uh, and there's no there's no Stutzla without you know the Sharks tanking. Um, I feel like Thomas Hurdle has taken the next step in his development. I feel like he's kind of reached that number one center status. Uh, you factor in a healthy Eric Carlson. Uh, you have, you know, Burns that's ready to play this season as well. Uh, I feel like it's a team that's far more balanced. Uh, and, you know, especially with the division that they're in, I, I think they can make noise. I think they can, they can push for the playoffs. And from what I've seen from them lately, uh, they're not missing Joe Thornton. Uh, they're not missing, you know, a, a plethora of players that have been let go. I feel like they're kind of slowly pushing towards uh, coming back to at least, you know, the middle point in the league. Mm. All right. Well, we touched on, on surprises. I think I would agree with just about all those. And Luke, I'll ask you now, disappointments. Who, who is disappointed? We talked when we did our, our pre-show uh, a couple weeks ago, who we think would surprise and disappoint. I don't remember what we said, but after this week and a half, who has, who has uh, disappointed you? Player or team? Can be either or. Well, I mean, it kind of it kind of goes along with um, Marco's surprises. Boston has looked questionable as of yet and I, I'm, I'm just looking at um i've just pulled up the standings here like it's so hard everyone it's is early. like two one and oh one one and one like it's it's so it's so tricky but um either new jersey's good or boston is struggling uh either or um minnesota's looked good uh i i think i i forget pat who is your calder pick i i had caprizov yeah okay so yeah, Kaprizov's looked good. Um, it's uh, that that division. I mean, I think everyone kind of had one two set yeah. out um, with Vegas and Colorado, either or. But I mean, aside from LA, when when you look at that, and maybe Anaheim too, like that's who knows yeah. really. Yeah. Um, I would love to see Minnesota do well. I want I want them to do well so so bad. Yeah. They just it's and they're playing without Marco Rossi. Yeah. yeah, like it, it's long. Yeah, it's um, it's long overdue for them, I think. But again, we'll see. They're three one and zero at this point. Um, we'll see. That's that's a big surprise for me. Um, Carolina has uh, and and I'm kind of speaking in relative terms because I had very high hopes for them. Again, three games in, um, I think they they could be looking better. But uh, it, it's hard to say, but I, I was very high on them. They were my, um, I had them over Tampa in our, in our preseason predictions, but uh, we'll see. I, I don't think it's anywhere near um, any kind of discussion about panicking there, but Carolina, I think could be looking better. Um, yeah, I, I, I leave it at that. There's a few other teams, especially in that division I could go into Detroit and Columbus are both interesting cases, but um, it's yeah. just so early, I think. All right. Well, the last the last thing I wanted to touch on, and this was um, Matthew. I think it was Matthews who said it, and that's about the league protecting their star players. And we talked about this, Luke, probably a year and a half ago. Some of the abuse that Pedersen was taking, and how no one really talked about it. And it was after the Montreal Toronto opening game that there were some cross checks that both teams took, that both teams' best players took, um, and now it's now everyone's saying the league needs to crack down on that. The league needs to crack down on that, and two days later, three days later, whenever Montreal played Ottawa, uh, Tim Stutzel is, is out after being cross-checked by Jake Muzzin. Um, what do you think is the appropriate response to this? I'll start with you, Marco. What do you think is the appropriate response to this? Because no one's disagreeing with, with what Toronto is saying. You don't want anyone to be cross-checked viciously. Brennan Gallagher broke his jaw. Matt Niskanen broke uh, Gallagher's jaw this playoffs. So no one talked about it. No one said a word. And that was right to the jaw. He's taken the same thing from, from Zdeno Chara. Gallagher, even last night, has taken, has taken a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of dirty stuff from, from some players. So nothing's wrong with it. But anyway, whatever. What do you think of this entire situation? I honestly, I feel like doing that creates a further and further divide between regular season hockey and playoff hockey. Ultimately, whatever. You don't want to get cross-checked as hard 82 games, 56 games this year. 
in a season. I can respect that, but know that when you get to the playoffs where it counts, where you need to win a round, uh, those, that, uh, that amount of cross-checking is going to be legal regardless because mm. it's the playoffs. And as much as they try to change the game at, you know, a, a, in the regular season, ultimately when it counts, the rule book gets incredibly reduced. And, and that's because, yes, we want to make sure that players get to the playoffs healthy, but in the playoffs, uh, no, 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 no. You're, you're, you're going to have to go through the damage if, it, if you want to win that cup. And I respect that far more than what's going on and, and what's being talked about with Matthews because I can respect Matthews coming out and, and, and the Leafs in general coming out and being like, we don't want our star players to get cross-checked, but I haven't heard a peep from Connor McDavid. Not a yep. word. Right. Whereas Sidney Crosby, when he first came into the league, he was whining a lot about that. And we, yeah. and, and this was 15 years ago, he was called Cindy yeah. for five years because of that by Flyers fans. It's the, the, the culture of hockey has changed so much that it's become like the, we've, we've allowed this conversation to happen. So if you, if we're at a point where we're going to say, we're going to crack down on cross-checking and anybody who's watched Montreal since the Toronto game, I think they have like four cross-checking or five cross-checking penalties in, Too many. in three games. Yeah. Um, amongst others, uh, I, I I feel like the league is aware that the league is going to listen on this because they want to make sure that their players, uh, the best players, are going to be there when it counts in the playoffs. Uh, but ultimately, I feel like as it happens any year, there's going to be awareness for two weeks, and then it's going to go back to normal. Yep. And I feel like that that is classic NHL hockey. <laughs> it's um like it it's tricky. I feel kind of torn because yeah, like you said Pat, no one is um no one is trying to argue with the Leafs. I just think it's uh it's just kind of I don't know what the word is, annoying, frustrating to see um Leafs fans all up in arms about Austin Matthews getting bullied in front of the net. Like it's just, it's not unique to them. And we've, we've talked about this. Like I, I yep. don't need to go on about this. It's not unique to the Leafs situation. Um, that doesn't, that doesn't discredit the problem at hand at all. Uh, I just, I think everyone, everyone, instead of uh, kind of being upset with, with each other, like different fan bases being upset with each other, there's a there's an external problem that yeah. the the league needs to needs to figure out because it's it's just kind of been around for yeah. as long as we can remember. So yeah, and I feel like uh, too bad Nick had to cut out because Stutzel's the one who got cross checked by Muzzin. Nick hates the Leafs probably the most. I think I think I don't know. It's it's we all like to poke fun, but Nick would probably have more more to say on this. Kind of just echoing what we we've talked about before. But yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. We'll see if it continues. Hopefully Stutzel's okay, and hopefully players aren't taking ab- abuse. But at the same time, I hope referees aren't uh, over-functioning and making calls off of simple hockey plays that are sometimes just a push with a stick and not necessarily a cross-check. But that just about does it as we wrap up here on uh, episode 50 of uh, Take to Take. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure to have you on, Marco. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, we'll be back next week and this will be posted soon. Also, actually, before we, before we wrap up, Montreal, Vancouver, 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. I'm going to go with a... 3-2 Habs win, but it's going to be very ugly. Marco, what, who do you think wins tonight? I was going to go with a 2-1 Habs win in overtime. Luke? That, that would be fun. I, I would like to, I wish last night ended in overtime. Yeah. Um, but whatever. Right? Like, fuck shootouts. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Is, it, is it Demko and Al, or Allen tonight? Or? Exactly, yeah. Yeah? It is, it is Allen? Oh, I, I mean, I, I would assume so. Like they didn't. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if it's Demko, but I'm just. A, I would. Okay. Assume. Pretty um, sure it's both that didn't okay. play. I, I feel. I don't know. I maybe I'm just hoping, but I think it's going to be another really good game. Um, Nick. I, I think Nick said the opposite, but I, I have a feeling it'll be. Um, hopefully they haven't learned from their mistakes last night too much. Yeah. But, uh, ooh, what do I say? Um, I'll say four three, uh, Vancouver in overtime. That would, All right. be, that would be monstrous. I would love Go with yes. the trend. Yep. No, why not? Goals in two games? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, buddy. but 
but this has I been hope. a fun this it's been a fun series and, and we'll get to do it all again on saturday yeah. uh, after tonight so uh for all those who tuned in marco thanks again for being here really really appreciate you're welcome back on whenever you'd like and uh for all those tuning in thanks so much and we'll see you next time take care guys